Hi everyone, this is Miss Anne and welcome to another Monday book tasting. Today we're going to be reading No Fixed Address by Susan Nielsen. And uh, this book is about a youth who is experiencing homelessness. Um, he makes an appearance on a game show and it is revealed on that game show that him and his mother are experiencing homelessness. Um, so we're going to read uh, about 20 pages of the book and then afterwards I'm going to go over some good read alikes as a reminder, we also have on Beanstack our reading challenge called Readbook. And that is about helping people to both see themselves in books, reflected, you know, in books, but also to see how other people are experiencing the world around them. Uh, so we call that windows and mirrors. So Readbook has a variety of challenges like in this case, reading books about those who are experiencing homelessness. So if you're interested in reading diverse books, check that out on our Beanstack uh, account information. So that's on warminstertownship.beanstack.org. Now, without further ado, let's get on to reading our book for this Monday book tasting called No Fixed Address by Susan Nielsen. <clears throat> November 27th, 1205 AM. My leg jiggled up and down. I shifted from one bum cheek to the other. My palms felt damp and my heart was pounding. I've never been interrogated before. You're not being interrogated, Felix. We're just having a chat. Are you going to record it? Why would I do that? It's how they do it on TV. Well, we're not on TV. The cold from the metal chair seeped through my pajama bottoms. Do cops watch cops shows? Well, of, of course. But isn't that like bringing your work home with you? Constable Lee smiled. Her teeth were very straight. My powers of observation, or POO, told me that she came from a middle-class family, one that could afford an orthodontist. My POO also told me she enjoyed her food. The buttons on her uniform were strained to the max. Not really, she answered. It's escapism for us, too. And we get to shout at the TV if they do something totally bogus. Like what? like record this type of conversation. We only record a conversation if someone has, char has been charged with a crime or is a suspect in a crime. Are you recording Astrid right now? I can't answer that. Oh boy, I hardly ever cry, but all of a sudden I thought I might burst into tears right in front of a cop. I think she could tell because she added, I highly doubt it. I breathe in, I breathe out. I sat up straight. I tried to look calm and dignified, even though I knew my blonde curls were sticking all out in all directions, because until everything went so terribly wrong, I had been in bed. Plus, I was wearing my ancient minions pajamas, which were juvenile and very too, and way too small. Constable Lee and her partner hadn't given us time to change. I'd like to call my lawyer, I said. Let me guess. You got that from TV, too? Well, yeah. Do you have a lawyer? No, but legally I'm allowed one, right? Except you don't need one. You don't, you haven't done anything wrong. So I could just leave? I suppose, but where would you go? I thought about Dylan and Winnie. Then I remembered that I told them I never wanted to see them again. When will they be done talking to Astrid? Soon, I'm sure. She stared at me, clicking her pen. Open, shut, open, shut. Mind if I ask why you don't call her mom? She says it's too hierarchical. I scanned the room, the huge room, full of desks and a handful of people for the hundredth time. For the hundredth time, I didn't spot Astrid. It'll be okay, I thought, me I thought messaged her, because she's always telling me she'll receive anything I send her. I don't believe that anymore, but under the circumstances, it was worth a shot. For the record, I said to Constable Lee, Astrid is a great parent. Good to know, she tapped on her keyboard. I'm going to ask you a few questions, okay? Okay. Let's start with your full name, Felix Frederick Knutson. She typed it into her computer, age 13. Well, almost, 12 and three quarters. Mom's full name, Astrid Anna Knutson. Address? I looked down at my feet. I wore my rubber boots, no socks. There hadn't been time to search for a pair. Constable Lee leaned toward me. Her shoulders were rounded. She did not have good posture. When we answered your call tonight, Felix, it did appear as if you were both living there. 
Oh, how I longed for my mom. She would have, she would have, she would have a plausible sounding explanation, but I'm not like her. I'm not a natural born stretcher of the truth. So I continued to stare at the floor. Constable Lee started typing, even though I hadn't said a word. Felix, she said gently, you can talk to me. I'm hungry. Of course, I should have asked. She pushed herself up from her desk and hitched her pants around her belly. We're talking vending machine snacks. Hope that's okay. Any allergies? Any preferences? No allergies. No preferences. Although, I am partial to anything cheese flavored. Constable Lee walked across the big room. I glanced around. A couple of cops were at their desk. One was reading Popular Mechanics and another was dozing. I swiveled Constable Lee's computer toward me. It was an official looking report. Name, Felix Frederick Nutston, age 12. Parents slash guardian, Astrid Anna Nutston, address NFA. I'm pretty good at figuring out acronyms and this one, given the context, came to me almost right away. No fixed address. I felt a ripple of dread. Astrid had warned me over and over, no one can find out where we live. Until tonight, I'd broken the rule only once. Our cover was blown. I tried to tell myself it wasn't my fault. I'd had no choice. I had to call the cops. If I hadn't, who knows what would have happened. Still, the bad guys got away. And who was at the police station? The innocent victims. Us. Two bags of cheesies landed on the desk in front of me, along with a can of Coke. Aren't we a nosy picker? A nosy parker? Constable Lee said as she swiveled the computer screen back. No one can agree on the origin of that expression, I said. Some people think it came from an archbishop in the 1500s named Parker who asked too many questions. Other people think that's hooey, since the phrase didn't appear till the end of the 19th century. I knew I was rambling, but I couldn't help it. You are a font of knowledge. My mom says I store facts like squirrels store nuts. Constable Lee tore open a bag of chips and popped one into her mouth. Now, you have to believe me when I say I'm here to help. I wanted to believe her, but I kept thinking of my mom, who snorted like a pig whenever a police car drove past, who liked to say, never trust that man. Which man? I'd asked when I was stronger. The man. It's an expression. It means any man or woman who's in a position of authority. So all I said to Constable Lee was, thanks, but we don't need any help. Really? Really. We'll be moving very soon. Yeah? Where? I don't know yet, but I'm coming into some money. The only question is how much? An inheritance? No. Selling some valuables? No. Robbing a bank? Very funny, no. So where's this money coming from? A game show. Well, now I'm intrigued. Tell me more. About the show? Constable Lee put her feet up on her desk about everything. I studied her face. My POO told me she was a decent person. Maybe if she knew the truth, she would see that we'd done nothing wrong. So I poured a bunch of cheesies down my throat. Then I told Constable Lee the whole truth and nothing but. Next chapter, a brief history of homes. We haven't always lived in a van. That only started four months ago, BV, before van. We lived in a 400 square foot basement. Before that, we lived in a 600 square foot apartment. Before that, we actually owned an 800 square foot condo. And before any of that, we lived with Mormer. Mormer's house. Mormer means mother's mother in Swedish. She was my grandmother. Astrid and I lived with her in her bungalow in New Westminster, just outside Vancouver until I was seven. Her house was crammed full of knickknacks from Sweden. She must have had 50 red and blue wooden Delarna horses. She also had a very large tomte collection. Tomtar, plural for tomte, are mischievous gnome-like creatures in Swedish folklore. They watch over you and protect your family. But if you don't trust them with respect, they can also be cruel. They might play a trick on you or steal your things or even kill your farm animals. Mormor gave me my own tomte on my fifth birthday. One she'd made herself out of, out of felt. He was four inches tall with a long white beard, a red cone shaped hat and red jacket. Your own protector, she said. I named him Mel. Mormor looked after me when Astrid was at work. My mom had two jobs back then. She taught an evening painting class in Vancouver at Emily Carr University and she answered phones in an insurance office. Once I'd saved enough, she'd say to me, we'll get our own place. She didn't like living with Mormor. 
but I did. Walmart took me to the park in the mornings and in the afternoons. I played imaginary games like Pirate Ship and Fort and Outer Space while she watched her shows. Drew, Maury, Ellen, Phil, Judge Judy, the woman on The View, they felt like friends. And I have Warmer to thank for introducing me to who, what, where, when with Horatio Bloss. It was her favorite show and it became mine too. Warmer was what's called a Lutheran and she read me Bible stories, but it had to be our little secret because Astrid said organized religion was the cause of all the world's woes and she'd broken up with the church a long time ago. We made a uh, pepar kakor, which is Swedish for gingerbread. And more and more let me eat balls of dough. At nap time, she let me curl up in her cushioned lap and doze while she watched TV. When I had just turned six, I woke up from one of those naps to find that Mormor was sleeping too. This was not unusual. She often took a mid-afternoon snooze. So I got up and played quietly on the floor with my Brio train set, which had belonged to my mom and her brother when they were little. After an hour or so, when Mormor still hadn't woken up, I gave her a tiny poke. Her head slumped further down onto her chest. Her skin was gray and cool to the touch. I noticed a dark stain underneath her. It was wet. I started to giggle, delighted. Mormor, you peed your pants. Up to that point, I had been the only one in our household to pee their pants. She didn't answer. Mormor? I knew something wasn't right, but I was little. I had not yet fully developed my P.O.O. I called my mom. She called 911 and came straight home, but there was nothing anyone could do. I missed Mormor a lot. I know my mother did too. For months afterward, I slept in Astrid's room, and I brought Mel in every night so he could watch over us while we slept. I wasn't taking any chances. The next home. Our brief brush with homeownership. Mormor left everything to my mom. It wasn't as much as Astrid had hoped it would be, because Mormor had wired some of her savings to a Nigerian prince. But when Astrid sold the house a year after Mormor's death, we had enough to put a down payment on a brand new condominium in Kitsilano on the west side of Vancouver. Even though I missed Mormor, I loved our new place. It was small, but it was ours. The chemical aroma of fresh carpet was still in the air. Everything sparkled with newness. Astrid hung her bold canvases everywhere. We ate my, father, my favorite foods for supper, like grilled cheese with pickles and fish sticks with peas. I started third grade at Waterloo Public School, and soon I had not just a friend, but a best friend, Dylan Brinkhoff, Brinkerhoff. And I hung out all the time playing with Legos and I'm reading books like Ripley's Believe It or Not and Grossology. We even made a magazine called Stories from Your Anus and wrote articles about UFO sightings and poltergeists. Astrid got another job answering phones at a TV production company and Emily Carr, where she still taught two nights a week, was just a short bus ride away. But a year and a half after we moved in, two things happened. Number one, Astrid lost her both her jobs. It wasn't anything she'd done, not this time. Her evening class didn't get enough enrollment for another semester, so it was canceled, and the production company went bankrupt. Number two, our building started to sink. Yes, sink. It had been built on top of uh, what used to be a riverbed. The condo owners were on the hook for the repairs, which were going to cost $40,000 each. We didn't have $40,000. We clung to the place for another year, but finally Astrid had to sell it at a loss. The next place, the two-bedroom rental. Really, it was one bedroom plus a den. We could hear our neighbors fighting, and the carpet smelled funky, but overall, it wasn't too bad. It was on the east side near Commercial Drive, which meant I had to switch schools in the middle of the year. I didn't make any close friends, but on the plus side, I didn't make any enemies either. I miss Dylan a lot. We had a few visits, but Astrid didn't own a car, and I was too young to take the bus alone. That meant Dylan's parents had to do all the driving, and they had two other kids with busy schedules. After a few months, we lost touch. Astrid couldn't find any office or teaching work, so she got her first ever waitress job on the drive. I had to spend quite a few evenings on my own, but I had my imagination and my library books, and I watched some of the shows Mormor and I used to enjoy together, like Who, What, Where, When. One night, Astrid came home early. She was fuming. This customer kept trying to feel my butt. Astrid has always been a firm believer in taking me, talking to me like an equal, yet I'm the one who who gets punished just because I threw a drink in his face so he'd stop. That's when I understood she'd been fired. We fell behind on the rent, but lucky for us, Astrid became friends with Yuri, the building superintendent, and he cut us some slack. A few times a week, she would make me dinner, then go downstairs to his apartment for a couple hours. I guess he was sort of her boyfriend, even if he didn't 
even if he never took her out on a proper date. Then Astrid met Abelard. She stopped visiting Yuri's apartment. I guess Yuri felt hurt because he stuck an eviction notice on our door. The next place, the one bedroom basement. We moved again, farther east, close to Boundary Road, that meant another new school. It was hard at this time. Most of the other kids had been together since kindergarten. They didn't need a new friend. What the heck is your gene pool? A tall, pinched looking girl named Marcia asked me one day. 50% Swedish, 25% Haitian, 25% French, I replied. Add it up and it equals 100% Canadian. She pursed her lips. You look like a clown. It wasn't the first time someone had made fun of me for my hair. When I was younger, I'd wanted my mom to cut it all off, but she'd refused. Now I'm glad she did. It's part of who I am. I'm, I'm like Samson before he met Delilah. It's my superpower and Astrid loves my hair. She says it reminds her of two of her favorite singers, Kanan and Art Garfunkel. She says it's good to have a distinct feature, and most of the time I agree. So I put up with idiots like Marsha right up to the end of sixth grade. But I didn't like that school. I didn't like our basement apartment either. It smelled musty, and even on Sundays it was dark. Plus, Abelard was there all the time. Astra managed to get another office job at BC Hydro. But that one didn't last either. She told me they laid some people off, and since she was last in, she was first out. But from stuff I overheard, I think it was more than that. I think she got lippy with her supervisor. I don't suffer fools gladly, I heard her say to Abelard. And that guy was such a fool. Two weeks after that, Abelard broke up with her, which brings me to the Westphalia, the van belonging to Abelard. My mom went, met him at a day-long meditation retreat. He was the instructor or gu guru. Astrid is still pretty, even though she is 44. She's tall and slender and has long, wavy blonde hair. I've seen men's heads turn when she walks down the streets. So even though Abelard was 10 years younger, he asked my mom out for coffee after the retreat, and from that moment on, they were inseparable. When we moved to the basement apartment, he pretty much moved in too, parking his Westphalia out front. Abelard reminded me of Jesus, but only in looks. He had long brown hair, a hipster beard, and a mustache. He said he was a Buddhist, and he blathered on a lot about peace and love and tolerance, which would have been fine if he wasn't such a dink. First of all, he mooched off my mom, even though it was obvious that we barely had enough to make ends meet. And second of all, he had a temper. He'd swear at my mom because she threw his yoga pants in the dryer instead of letting them drip dry, or because she'd accidentally interrupted one of his meditation sessions. He was an angry Buddhist. I couldn't stand him. One night in July, Abelard told Astrid that he was heading to India on a spiritual journey and he couldn't be tethered to her anymore. They fought. I left the apartment and walked around the block 10 times. On the one hand, I felt bad for Astrid because I knew she liked Abelard. On the other hand, I was relieved. She deserved so much better. By the time I returned, Abelard was gone, but his Westphalia wasn't. It was still in the driveway. Astra told me Abelard had gifted it to her, his small way of thanking her for being such a freeloader, for being such a freeloader. Now I'm finding out that Abelard has accused her of stealing the van. I know my mom sometimes embellishes the truth, but any, any thinking person would be nuts to take Abelard at his word because the, the guy is a snake. My best guess is that the truth lies somewhere in the middle, but I'm glad I'm getting ahead of myself. A week after Abelard left for India, the landlord changed their locks. He'd been trying to get us out for a while because we were behind on the rent. We came home to find our belongings stacked on the front lawn. My gerbil Horatio sat on the top of the pile in his cage. Horatio had been my 10th birthday present. I would really wanted a dog, so at first I was disappointed when Astrid got me a rodent. But when I looked into his beady little eyes and petted his soft black and white fur, I fell in love. Even though he couldn't fact or run or do tricks, even though he had a brain the size of a pea, I adored him. So when I saw him perched precariously on top of our stuff, I lost it. What if his cage had fallen and he'd been hurt? What if the door hadn't been securely fastened and he'd escaped? What if a hungry dog had come along? Horatio didn't look traumatized, but then again, it's hard to read complex emotions on Gerbil's face. I started to cry loudly. Astrid grabbed me in a hug. It's okay, Lila Grubin. It's okay. 
Lila Gruben is one of her pet names for me. It means little old man in Swedish. Apparently when I was born, that's exactly what I look like, bald and wrinkly. How is it okay, I wailed. We have nowhere to live. She gripped my shoulders and made me look at her. Don't you worry, I will figure something out. I always do. And that brings me to Soleil's, Soleil's house. Astrid started phoning her friends to see if someone could put us up for a few nights. Something my POO has taught me over the years is that my mom is really good at making friends and even better at losing them. So I wasn't super su surprised when Ingrid said no or when Karen hung, hung up on her. Astrid thought for a moment, then she said, I'll try Soleil. Soleil was one of Astrid's students in her painting class at Emily Carr and a fellow mom. They'd belong, become fast friends. Then two years ago, they had a huge fight. I heard the whole thing from my bedroom. It started out as a celebration because Soleil had sold another painting, this time for a, a record sum. But after they'd finished a second bottle of wine, Astrid started talking about the mediocrity of the masses and how she couldn't understand why boring, bland work like Soleil's was selling while her superior abstracts weren't. Soleil left in tears and they didn't speak again. Until now. She says we can stay with her for a bit, Astrid said when she got off the phone. She looked just as surprised as I did. We packed everything into the Westphalia and drove to Soleil's new house near Main Street in King Edward. She was waiting for us in the driveway of a big modern home when we pulled up. Astrid whistled quietly. Someone's moving up in the world. Soleil smiled when she saw me. She's tall and broad-shouldered and has a friendly face. Felix, you've grown so much. Then she gave my mom a lukewarm hug. Astrid, how are you? What happened? Last minute uh, renovation my scum by my scumbag landlord. I almost had to admire how effortlessly the lies rolled off her tongue. Soleil helped us carry everything into a bright, spacious basement. A painting of yellow roses hung on the wall. I remember that, said Astrid. You painted it at Emily Carr, and you told me it was technically fine, but emotionally dead. You didn't think I was living up to my full potential. Astrid's silence filled the room. I watched Soleil's pale skin turn bright pink. My rose paintings have become my best seller. I can't seem to keep up with demand. My PLO told me we were heading into dangerous territory. Would you like to pet my gerbil? I asked, but Astrid spoke before Soleil could answer. I'm happy for you, Soleil, I really am. I breathed a sigh of relief <sighs> until she added, your work is perfect for carpet lobbies and boardrooms. Oh boy. Soleil wound, wound, her, wound her arms tightly around her chest. Arm pads, arm pads, arm pads, uh, parents are arriving at the end of the week, but you're welcome to stay until then. You didn't mention that before, Astrid said. I'm mentioning it now, said Soleil, her gaze fixed on the ro yellow roses. Soleil and her family had plans for the evening, so Astrid and I walked over to Helen's Grill and ordered the all-day breakfast for supper. I felt anxious. Not having a place to live can do that to a person. The waitress brought us our plates. Why do breakfast foods always taste better at dinner? Astrid asked. It's a scientific mystery. We ate in silence for a while, then Astrid said, I have a fun idea. I looked at her, my mouth full of scrambled eggs. We'll live in the van, just for a few weeks, until I find us another place. Think about it, Felix. It'll be the ultimate summer vacation, the freedom, the adventure. My favorite book when I was 19 was On the Road by Jack Kerouac. It'll be a blast. I thought about it. The farthest I'd ever traveled was the Victoria. My entire class had visited the provincial parliament building when I was 10. Marsha had pulled my hair on the bus the whole way there and the whole way back. Could we travel? Go across BC? Or maybe as far as the Rockies? Of course. Can we afford it? For a month, yes. I have some savings. If you have savings, why do we fall behind on the rent? Esther popped a strip of bacon into her mouth. The landlord, the landlord was gouging us. The number of times I asked him to repair things that never got fixed, he owed us a few months rent free for the crap we put up with. Oh, so what do you say? Ultimate summer vacation? I wasn't convinced, but I didn't want to be a party pooper. I guess, sure, we high five to seal the deal. And that brings me to the beginning of August, to the day we started living in the van. So that is uh, about 20 pages in. And that leads to August when they're living in their van. So as I mentioned, this is a book about, you know, youth experiencing homelessness. So some other books that you might want to pick up that have similar either themes or writing styles. Um, the Exact Location of Home by Kate Mesner. 
Um, similar themes of like secrecy of homelessness and things like that. Another good book, um, and this is more featuring a realistic fiction and a young boy about 12 years old, same as this one is booked by Kwame Alexander. Um, and another good book that might be a good read alike for this is Crenshaw by Catherine Applegate. Again, trouble at home, you know, young, young boys, you know, first person narrative still similar to this. Um, I got all of these on, um, Novelist, which we subscribe to. So if you have a library card, you can go on to Novelist. It's one of our e-resources and you can find good read-alikes for the books that you're reading at home. And as always, if you're looking for this book, um, it is available at the Warminster Library. And we hope that you guys are doing well and we hope to see you guys very soon at our library. Until next week, we'll be reading another one. We'll be reading Ghost Boys next week. So until then, have a great day. Bye everyone.